In 2020, I don't mean to scare you with that date, Michael Saylor, the CEO of MicroStrategy, purchased $250 million worth of Bitcoin and has since poured billions more into it. And in the process, becoming one of the most popular voices of Bitcoin advocacy in the past few years. But a recent clip of him on a podcast combined with, and I'll play the clip in a minute, combined with a very awkward Twitter thread in which he defends his statements has had people questioning his understanding of Bitcoin. There's no second best. There's no second best crypto asset. The clip that started this whole thing was only picked up on by a few of the most hardcore Bitcoiners because, well, I'll just show you the clip and I'll see if you can figure out the problem with it yourself. I think what they're missing is that the efficiency of the network is improving with Moore's law exponentially. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, that's what they're missing. And so when people make these statements about uh, Bitcoin, what they're doing is the same thing. They're, they're missing the point. It's not secured by energy. It's secured by digital energy or an, an encrypted energy. And the efficiency with which that uh, encryption is taking place is improving somewhere in the range of 36 to 40 percent a year. With a few twists, you realize in about 18 months, you double the efficiency of the network and you keep doing it, you know, for the first 30, 40, 50 years. You know, maybe, maybe you continue to do it for a long time to come. So for some context, this was a discussion about the 2017 WEF article that we mentioned in our video on energy. I'll put a link somewhere. The article predicted that Bitcoin would use all of the world's energy by the year 2020. Obviously that was very wrong. But besides just some wacky comments about Bitcoin being secured by encrypted energy, which is not just wrong on account of the fact that Bitcoin doesn't use encryption, but also that it's not secured by energy any more than a padlock is. But I digress. Saylor is essentially making the case that Bitcoin's energy consumption is somehow offset by the increasing efficiency of computer hardware over time. It seems to make sense, right? But the reason that it's wrong isn't so obvious to anybody that doesn't have a deeper understanding of how Bitcoin mining works. So, to explain where Saylor goes wrong here, let's switch out Bitcoin mining for a padlock, because it's the simplest form of security that I can think of, and I really like metaphors. The reason that Saylor said that Bitcoin is secured by energy is forgivable, because it's half right. Bitcoin is secured by energy in the same way that a padlock is secured by the energy with which it resists being broken. But this can be said of quite literally any security system, making it a platitude and not quite so much wrong as it is useless. If you were to describe what actually secures a padlock, it'd be a little bit more specific. Maybe you'd say the structural integrity of its material design, for instance. So what if we were to get more specific about what secures Bitcoin and apply the same level of nuance in our description? Well, mining Bitcoin is essentially a really costly global competition to guess a password. And there are two types of miners that try to guess this password, attackers and defenders. But how does Bitcoin define these two groups? Is it based on morals or law or ethics? No, computers don't care about any of that. As far as Bitcoin is concerned, Defenders are the most powerful group and attackers are the less powerful group. And it determines the power of the group via the assumption that whoever won the password guessing competition must have been the most powerful. And assuming a healthy Bitcoin like the one that we have today, the most powerful group also happens to be in agreement with the vast majority of Bitcoin users. And this is thanks to that neat decentralization thing that everyone keeps harping on about. But if the most powerful group are always the defenders, how could we even define an attack? If attackers gained the power necessary to become the most powerful group, then they just get relabeled the defenders, right? So there's no real way of distinguishing between who's defending the Bitcoin protocol and who's attacking it. Well, Bitcoin itself will always trust the most powerful group of miners, right? I mean, just for example, imagine that Russia was able to buy loads of expensive computer hardware and somehow managed to single-handedly source as much energy as the entire world uses in Bitcoin mining and then proceeded to change Bitcoin's code in their favor. And this change of Bitcoin's code is quite clearly an attack, one that was made possible through their accumulation of energy and hardware. So what prevents against this? What secures Bitcoin? If we are going to be specific about it, what secures Bitcoin? The exact same thing that serves as the reason for which Bitcoin trusts the most powerful group of miners, the structural integrity and durability of its incentive design. 
It's not that nobody could do what Russia did in our example before. They very much could. It would just be so incredibly costly that the cost of attempting it combined with the risk of failure would far outweigh any reward of success. I mean, imagine if you had a box that was protecting a £5 note and it was really secure because the only way to actually steal the £5 note, and it would let you steal it, but the only catch is that you have to pay £10 to steal the £5 note. Sure, technically anybody can come and steal the £5 note, but nobody is going to. Nobody's going to. This drastically reduces the probability of a successful attack, and a good way to define the security of any system is as a measurement of the probability of a successful attack. So this £5 note box thing is pretty secure, because sure, anybody technically is able to go and steal the £5 note, but nobody is going to. There's just not a good reason to. Still, with enough energy and insanity, somebody could technically break Bitcoin. And what's important to note here is that since energy is responsible for both the attacks upon and defenses of Bitcoin, it is not responsible for Bitcoin security, but rather the stage upon which Bitcoin's true state of security is determined. And what actually is that security? An emergent property of the power balance of honest and dishonest miners between attackers and defenders. It's the incredible incentive design of Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining that ensures that this balance always remains in favor of the defenders. If dishonest miners account for 40% of Bitcoin's mining power, then Bitcoin in this scenario is not secure because the likelihood of a dishonest or thieving addition to the Bitcoin blockchain is 40% every 10 minutes. And since security is a measurement of the probability of a successful attack, Bitcoin could be considered unsecure not only if 40% of its mining power is in the hands of attackers, but also if it was very easy and probable or possible for 40% of Bitcoin's mining power to end up in the hands of attackers. I mean, an axe murderer with an axe is pretty scary. An axe murderer with an axe on the table is still scary. You will not feel secure in that room. Even though he doesn't have it, it's over there. If it's easy to get, the probability goes up and the situation becomes less secure. And what makes this so unlikely in Bitcoin's current state? What makes it so secure? The integrity and durability of its incentive design. So what do I actually mean by incentive design? Incentives are just motivators of human action. And Bitcoin has factored them into its design with mining. The general idea is that it's more profitable to play by the rules than to break them. And it's very hard to break them. This ensures that the majority of mining power stays in the hands of people playing by the rules. And all of this is achieved by what is essentially just a massive password guessing competition that's also very costly. That bit is important. And the winner gets to participate in the addition of new blocks to the blockchain, as well as voting on code changes and the like. But here's the thing, right? As the number of competitors increases, so does the difficulty of winning. So Michael Saylor's statement that increasing the energy efficiency of the computer hardware used to make these password guesses somehow equates to a reduced energy expenditure of Bitcoin mining is wrong. NASCAR. I've never watched it, but I know it's about cars going in circles and whoever gets to the finish line wins or something along those lines. We can explain exactly why Michael's wrong just by using this. I mean, the password guessing competition and the driving competition are both very similar. If we just alter some of the parameters of a driving competition, then it really starts to resemble the Bitcoin mining race. Instead of having cars that have to, for instance, get to a certain finish line and the person that does it in the least amount of time wins, Bitcoin mining is more like you give the drivers 10 minutes for their race and whoever ends up going the furthest is the one that wins. And Sailor here is just somehow saying that if you gave all of the drivers faster cars, then they would complete the 10 minute race quicker. When in reality, they would just go further with the time that they're given. The race finishes at 10 minutes regardless. Faster cars just means more distance. I mean, in the exact same way, I say exact, kind of. In the same way, if you gave miners more efficient computer hardware that was capable of attempting more password guesses per unit of energy expended, then they would make more password guesses because they have a budget and they would spend that budget and it would do more. They'd get more bang for their buck. They would guess more passwords with their jewels or they would get more miles with their gallons. It's the same concept. In the same way, if you give miners more efficient computers, the difficulty of guessing this password will just increase and the energy expenditure will remain idle. It's the cost of guessing passwords that underpins the incentive structure of Bitcoin mining. The number of passwords that is guessed is arbitrary. The fact that you have to guess more passwords in order to find the correct one doesn't make the network any more secure if both attackers and defenders can now go and make those extra guesses at no extra cost. It doesn't make it more secure. 
since this applies to both attackers and defenders equally. Naturally, he received some backlash from Bitcoiners about this, and unfortunately took to Twitter to defend his case. I say unfortunately because I was hoping it was just like a misunderstanding, and that in reality he was just talking about predictive models failing to account for Moore's law when making energy predictions based on hash rate trends alone. But then he went and said this, the amount of energy necessary to generate a given hash rate has fallen from 1,250 joules per terahash to 21.5 joules per terahash in approximately eight years. 98% reduction in energy use for an equivalent amount of security. Oh, oh, it's getting late. It's getting late. He really did say that. Network efficiency is radically improving. One terahash is a trillion password guesses in the context of Bitcoin mining. And he's saying that because it now takes 98% less energy to make the same amount of guesses, then energy use has reduced while maintaining the same level of security. This is stupid, and would only be true if there was some universal deity that prevented attackers from benefiting from the same technological advancement. It seems like he's equating the number of passwords guessed to the security of the network. When has being able to guess passwords faster ever been indicative of better security? You've armed both sides of the war with bigger guns, but you haven't changed the balance of power from which Bitcoin's security is an emergent property. And then there's that last bit, network efficiency is greatly increasing, or whatever. Network efficiency is radically improving. The password competition is the mechanism by which network participation is authorized, and the network is defined by its participants. So how can the network's efficiency have been increased if the efficiency gains don't occur inside of the network? The actual part of this competition system that is benefiting from increasingly efficient computer hardware occurs outside of the Bitcoin network. It can quite literally be done offline without network connection of any type. You can make scratch cards easier to scratch, but that doesn't increase the efficiency of the televisation of the lottery numbers. So is this all to say that Bitcoin is doomed to become an energy consuming behemoth? No. If you want to learn more about the many misconceptions around Bitcoin on the environmental front, we made an entire video on muddying the water. Check it out somewhere on the screen. Anyway, I hope that you found something within my ramblings to be useful with your understanding of Bitcoin. And if you think anything that I said was stupid, let me know down in the comments. Michael Saylor, where you at? But that's just about it. Thank you for watching. Skip to you. You know you do something you think it'll be funny and then you do it and you realize that, that wasn't funny.